If you were to rewind time and play it back again, it's not clear you'd end up with the internet. I'm not sure you'd say the same thing about E equals MC squared or truss bridges or other pieces of technology that really are suited to what they do and are such the best solution, whether in theory or in practice, that you figure humanity would have gotten there one way or another eventually. With the internet, it reflects so many idiosyncratic choices about how to build a global network that it's important to remember they didn't have to be made that way. We could have ended up with a global network or set of networks that were a lot like the legacy telephone systems that prevailed from uh, the early 20th century through into the early 21st. Uh, they might have been like CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, The Source, MCI Mail. If you took a snapshot in 1982, 83, 85, everybody figured that the future of global networking was going to be something resembling those competing services, and one of them would just outcompete the others. Instead, out of left field came this unusual creature that we call the internet, and there are several things that made it unusual. The first of which is the folks who put its protocols together uh, were not well funded and had no particular expectation of making money from it. So in that sense, whatever you might know about Silicon Valley, the fundamentals of the internet were not as a dot-com startup. They were instead as here are a number of ways that you could take existing networks and have them interoperate with one another and that way you'd have a global network with no main menu, no CEO, no business plan, no particular committee even that runs it. A handful of functions, mostly what we'd call ministerial, merely administrative, are centralized, but the rest is pretty much what I'd call a collective hallucination. There's a commons that exists in part through modest government subsidies to do this kind of research to produce the internet, um, but the rest is left up to the users to figure out what they want to use a network for. So in that sense, the essence of the internet is a set of protocols that allow any given points of presence that are connected to communicate with one another and not have to worry so much about how the bits will work their way from point A to point Z. Um, I have tended to call such technologies generative technologies. And the core feature of a generative technology is that it tends to welcome contribution from nearly any quarter. And applied to the internet, that means that in order to become a point of presence on the internet, to start exchanging bits with one other entity, or perhaps if you think of yourself as a server, with hundreds of thousands or millions of other entities, if they're wanting to beat a path to your doorstep and get the bits that you have to offer, that there's no gatekeeping to that. Anybody can set up on a kind of virtual hilltop, a server, maybe it's a web server, maybe it's some other kind of server, and you're off to the races. That's very different from the CompuServe configuration of having to cut a deal with that company in order to be exposed to its subscribers. It's different from cable television. It's different from pay television uh, or, or free television, where uh, there's a broadcast tower and a government will issue a license, or itself will be the broadcaster, uh, on limited bandwidth to uh, an audience. And there's an interesting parallel kind of generative technology that really made the internet come into its own. And that is the typical endpoint, the thing that you would use to get onto the internet ended up being what we call the PC, the personal computer. The PC's origins were less corporate and more hobbyist originally created by hobbyists for other hobbyists, and then by companies, but companies that in America would be called Heath or Heathkit, kind of build your own clock rather than buy one, not thought of as a big, broad market product, but rather a niche. That, were the, that was the origins of the personal computer. And in 1977, when the Apple II was unveiled by Steve Jobs, 21 years old at the time, that was a computer that when it left the factory, was not itself useful. You would plug it into a television set, turn it on, and you would be treated to a blinking cursor. That was all it was doing. It was waiting for you to write software or to put in software written by somebody else. You've either purchased or been given or loaned. And uh, that is another example then of a generative technology. Unlike, say, a smart information appliance at the time, late 70s, early 80s, might have been a 
a word processor or something. You buy it, you turn it on, you get a word processor rather than a blinking cursor. You get a document that you're ready to draft and then you can print it out. These PCs were general purpose, but originally to no purpose. And there was an understanding that anybody in the world could write code for it and circulate that code and others, whether or not they were coders, could run the code. And two years after the introduction of the Apple II, we saw uh, Bob Frankston and Dan Bricklin of Boston, Massachusetts, produce VisiCalc, the first digital spreadsheet ever. And suddenly, business around the world is noticing the personal computer. Now it's what we would call an enterprise computer because it's very useful in businesses to have spreadsheets. And if you wanted to run VisiCalc, you needed an Apple II. Apple IIs are flying off the shelves. Apple has no idea why. They have to do market research to figure out what made their hobbyist computers so popular. And the answer was the generative nature meant people could code for it, didn't have to make a deal with Apple in order to get the code in front of people. You just needed your audience to have Apple computers. And sure enough, they went out and got them so they could run something like VisiCalc. That generative technology meant that uh, Somebody actually um, uh, from the Southern Cone, uh, Robert Tatum, a researcher at the University of Tasmania in the psychology department, could write something in 1995 called Trumpet Windsock, because he liked to play the trumpet. And that was kind of the keystone in the arch, the golden spike that allowed, for the first time, Windows PCs to speak internet. So if you had a Windows PC and you ran Trump at Winsock, you could find yourself an internet service provider and get yourself online. And I think it's quite fitting that it was this gentleman's piece of freeware that actually was the gateway, rather than even that Microsoft had foreseen the importance to its own customers of the internet and had built internet connectivity into Windows rather than building a paperclip that would tell you that it looked like you were trying to write a Word document. Do you need help with that? So thanks to PCs that could be repurposed and a network that was not a source of content but merely a facilitator of its movement, we ended up by, say, the year 2000 with this incredibly doubly generative system that allowed anybody anywhere to write code to use this neutral network to ship the code to others, to do it under any number of business models, for money, not for money, uh, for glory, not for glory. And that's how we saw the smart appliances fall by the wayside, and we saw the proprietary networks fall by the wayside. Now, that's a snapshot as of 2000. In the intervening decade and a half, we've seen a lot of growing pains. We've seen security threats to the internet. If anybody can write code and it can easily work its way onto your machine, how do you know the code is any good? And the answer is you don't always know that. Microsoft, part of its way of talking about the importance of getting your code from accredited sources like Microsoft, likens it to a sandwich. If you found a sandwich on the street, would you pick it up and eat it? Probably not. So why would you do the same with your code? Now, the fact that you don't literally eat code is probably one of the answers. You can run it, and if there's a problem, you can reboot the machine rather than have to go to the physician. But uh, that quirk has meant that as business models have come about to make it worth somebody's while to compromise your machine, to make it so that it answers to them far away rather than to you, the owner of the machine, we have seen great security problems arise. And my concern, starting in around 2006, 2007, as I saw those problems on the horizon, was that the cures for the problems might be as bad as the problems themselves, in different ways. But we are, unfortunately, I think, too often thinking that we are in a dilemma where we either have to suffer the vulnerability of arbitrary code running on our machines, scooping up our data, even worse, um, disturbing its integrity. I don't know if it's worse to lose your spreadsheet or simply have cells within it transposed and you don't know until six months later that none of your numbers in your payroll make any sense. Um, but that on the one hand, to suffer those kinds of depredations either on your own machine or magnified to a merchant that has a server in which it keeps customer data that's often running a PC operating system, equally vulnerable. 
Um, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand is locking stuff down so much that the wonderfully chaotic environment that gave rise to so much cool code out of odd and unusual corners could be stymied. That we could get back de facto to the worlds of CompuServe, Prodigy, and AOL because we will only trust code from a limited number of sources. Figuring out how to balance between those two undesirable endpoints to me is one of the fundamental questions about the future of the internet.